Bome la bontate ba mohohat ma hohatlo wa selese. Te sele. Just want to get it right. Leaders of different political parties this afternoon, business and community leaders, religious and faith leaders, all members of the staff and students of the University of the Free State, and all other people watching through LifeLink, and everybody else that I probably haven't mentioned here in the protocol, because I've done all of this for all the other speakers that don't have to do that again, all protocol observed. So welcome to you all. Um, I particularly would like to give a warm welcome um, to all of you to the University of the Free State and to the King Mushweshwe Memorial Lecture this afternoon. Now the University launched the Mushweshwe Project in 2004 as part of its centenary celebrations. The inaugural King Mushweshwe Lecture was presented in 2006, so two years after the project was conceptualized in 2004, and that inaugural lecture was presented by Professor Njambula Ndebele, who's chairman of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, and is also currently the chancellor of the University of Johannesburg. He was formerly also the uh, vice chancellor at the University of Cape Town. So the purpose of this lecture is really to provide a platform for public debate and for discussions about the key challenges of nation building. It is about reconciliation and it is also about leadership. And it's an integral part of the University of the Free State's mission of producing and disseminating knowledge on African affairs and promoting awareness on Africa for Africans but also for the global community. And it's very importantly to highlight the importance of what I call ethical leadership in the socio-political and the economic transformation of South Africa and the rest of the continent. But we furthermore also honoring the leadership legacy of King Mosheshe I as founder of the Basutu nation. And I believe throughout his reign, King Mosheshe has demonstrated the power of ethical leadership, which is not only a model for African leadership, but surely providing an example for leadership globally. And I would like to quote from Jabulan Debele, and I think that was part of the, of the inaugural address, where he talked about leadership. And he said, and I opened the quote, leadership is what all of us do when we express sincerely our deepest feelings and thoughts. When we do our work, whatever that is, with passion and integrity. When we recall that all that mattered when you were doing your work was not the promise of some reward afterward, but the overwhelming sense of appropriateness that it had been done. That is how Njabula and Debele define leadership. And I think we all are quite impressed that we have a formidable speaker this afternoon to present the 2018 King Mashwesha Memorial Lecture. And I certainly hope that you will enjoy this lecture with us this afternoon. I personally am looking forward to a colleague, uh, somebody that I know over many years, and that I am quite respected to uh, have here this afternoon and to present the King Mashweshwe Memorial Lecture for 2018. Once again, welcome to you all. Thank you.
Right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I feel very honored and privileged to be afforded the opportunity to introduce to you uh, the guest speaker, Professor Itumele Mosala. Uh, to this very important occasion on the University of the Free States calendar, the fourth Morena Mushashu, the first memorial lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, I am going to take this opportunity to refer to him affectionately. That is in a way that his loved ones, as well as his supporters, will refer to him. That is Professor Itu Musala. Prof. Itu Musala schooled in Bloemfontein and later on went to Tabanchu where he obtained his teaching qualifications at the Stradom College, from whence he furthered his education and, uh, um, in numerous institutions around the country and abroad. He obtained the following degrees, AFTS, MBA, MA, and PhD. He also received numerous certificates from various institutions around the country and outside the country. Some of his certificates are the following. I cannot quote all of them, so I've chosen few. Business analytics, the data explosion, health data and analysis, social media analytics, business fundamentals, the secret of brands, etc. He can be described as a teacher, liberation theologian, and a progressive one, a traveled scholar, and an engaged academic, author, analyst, finance and social science researcher, public intellectual, qualified corporate financial strategist and a politician because he's a founder member and leader of the black consciousness movement. He rubbed shoulders with the greats, Steve Biko, Bani Pichani, to name the few. Clearly, ladies and gentlemen, I'm justified to declare that Prof. Itu Musala enjoys the ability to wear many caps in life. When asked about where his passion lies, he said at some stage, primarily I'm a black theologian. I'm a believer, a socialist and materialist. For me, the three go together in as much as I see religion and cultural practice. A material practice while both traditional African belief and Christianity are carriers of a socialist vision. And I tend to agree fully with him. Professor Musala contributed epistemologically by means of literature, where he edited numerous books and features on numerous articles. For example, he features in books such as the one entitled Itumele Mosala, a black theologian. He also features in numerous articles, as I, said, as, as I said, such as the relevance of traditional African religion and their challenge to black theology, as well as the rise and demise of black theology. He authored books such as the Biblical Human Humanities and Black Theology in South Africa, The Unquestionable Rights to be Free, Black Theology from South Africa, and Hammering Swords into Plowness, Essays in Honor of Archbishop Mpilo Desmond Tutu. With regard to work experience, ladies and gentlemen, Prof. Musala worked at different levels of employment inside South Africa and outside, especially in Botswana and the United Kingdom. He worked as, as a teacher, a lecturer, 
high level research panelist, chief director, director general, vice chancellor and principal, especially Northwest, Northwest University, regional vice president, a politician, and a reverend. Ladies and gentlemen, let us join hands in welcoming the guest speaker, Professor Itu Musa. I'm not young any longer, but I still remember that in my days, we used to say master of ceremonies, <laughs> program director. Thank you for those very kind words of introduction. I must also thank the vice chancellor for basically saving me this afternoon. My wife worked for the protocol division of the Department of International Relations, Foreign Affairs. <clears throat> and I used to have a good time when I still wrote theological lectures because I knew she knew nothing about theology, and so she would not interfere. In the last 24 years, she's been in the protocol division of the Department of Foreign Affairs in Pretoria, and she's, she's extremely finicky about protocol. She insists on seeing the first page of every speech that I write and I'm going to give publicly. And she edits it and um, I keep saying to her, I'm not a politician, I'm a revolutionary. <laughs> but I was worried about making mistakes on the protocol part of my address this afternoon. There's another reason why I was worried, which has to do with the time I spent at the University of Botswana in the late 1970s, early 1980s, when I was lecturing there. I had a colleague who was the head of education, Department of Education at the university, who was recruited to government as a DG for the Ministry of Education. He spent only one week in the job because his first task was to, to write a speech for the Minister of Education. Um, am I too close to this mic or is there something else? I'm hearing an echo. Are you all right? If you are all right, I'm fine. You're fine trying to find the position here. Um, he spent one week in the job because of the speech that he wrote for the Minister of Education. He wrote a normal speech, and then he wrote notes at the end of the speech, uh, and said in the notes, if other members of parliament ask you questions, these are the possible questions that will come. If they say this, you must say that. If they ask you this, you must answer in this way, and so on and so on. And so the minister went and read the speech. And at the end of the speech, the minister continued. If they ask you this, <laughs> You must say this. If they ask you that, you must say that. And a week later, he was back at the university. 
decided that government was not his thing. And so I don't have to make that mistake today. I wrote the speech myself, including the first page. I'm truly honored and humbled to be here today. I'm humbled because of the invitation, but I'm humbled much more because of the person, the character, the stature of the leader that this lecture is dedicated to. Morena Moshweshwe Wapil. And so for that reason, I greet all of you who responded to the invitation from the university. I'd like to place my thanks to the students of the university, the workers, the lecturers, the professors, and the leadership of the province and of this place, Mangau. There are two other reasons why I would like to mention and to underscore my special feeling of gratitude for this honor. Firstly, although I have not had a great deal to do with the University of the Free State over the years, I don't feel foreign to this university. My home where I grew up, the streets where I played and kicked a soccer ball, the schools I attended as a child and as a teenager, the churches I attended, where I worshipped, and not least, the girlfriends I had <laughs> are all down the road from here. <laughs> I hope some of them are still alive. <laughs> and so I'm home. In fact, I don't feel at home. I am at home. I come from a township famously known as Four and Six location. It is the only township in Bloemfontein where every street has a church, except my street, <laughs> Martley Street. Historical rumor has it that the name of the township is associated with the struggles of the workers during the strike of 1922, the minor strike of 1922, and the related issues of housing and land that underpinned the resistance by the workers. Secondly, program director, this month, September, is holy month. It is sacred in the political calendar of the, of the tradition that I am associated with. I'm referring to the tradition of black consciousness in South Africa. This month is Biko month. Next week on the 12th of September is the date on which Stephen Bantu Wonge Biko was murdered while in police custody. He died because he dared to love black people. He died because he dared to declare the indisputable fact that black people are human. He died because he raised a movement to wage a political and relentless war in defense of the dignity and humanity of black people. 
He died for the struggle cause to liberate black people in South Africa and black people everywhere in the world where colonization, exploitation, oppression is a characteristic of how they live. He was not, his was not a struggle against apartheid. It was a struggle against colonialism and racism. Apartheid was simply a local mutation of 300 years of colonial dispossession. In the white world in which black people lived then and now, it is not a foregone conclusion that black people are human. We get it wrong when we miss that reality. Cornel West, an African-American public intellectual who is a professor at Princeton and Harvard universities in the US, addresses this issue with a poignancy that clarifies why Biko would not be stopped in his determination to die for the liberation of black people. In his book, Prophesy Deliverance, an Afro-American Revolutionary Christianity, he dedicates a chapter to a phenomenon that he calls the genealogy of modern racism. And he begins that chapter by writing, and I quote, the notion that black people are human beings is a relatively new discovery in the modern West. The idea of black equality in beauty, culture, and intellectual capacity remains problematic and controversial within the prestigious halls of learning and the sophisticated intellectual circles. The Afro-American encounter with the modern world has been shaped first and foremost by the doctrine of white supremacy, which is embodied in institutional practices and, and acted every day in everyday folk ways under varying circumstances. When I was a professor at Cambridge University in the early 1990s, those of you who know Cambridge will know that it's a small little village. It's an old town. If you've been to Fort Hare in Alice, you will know what Cambridge looks like. Very small town. And so the pavements are small. Everything is small in Cambridge. And in spite of the fact, or let me put it this way, Professors at Cambridge get invited to colleges. Cambridge is made up of colleges. We go to dinner, invited from your college to another college. And professors, when they eat dinner, they must be wearing their academic gowns. So every afternoon at five o'clock at Cambridge, you'll see professors walking across the various streets of, of Cambridge in their academic gowns honoring dinners in whatever college they were going to. Mine was not such a pleasant time on the streets of Cambridge, because in spite of the fact that I would also be wearing an academic gown, which means that I must be a professor. <laughs> when I walked across somebody at Cambridge going in one direction and me going to the other, I would always have to give way so that they could pass. And I was getting angrier and angrier about this because it reminded me of Pretoria in the olden days. In Pretoria in the olden days, black people did not walk on, on, on pavements. They were not allowed to walk on pavement. So I got angry. So one day I thought, I'm not going to give way. I'm going to walk on this pavement. And so I walked and collided with another professor who was extremely sorry. He really was sorry. I could see also, and I actually agreed that he was sorry. And I said, what's the problem? Why are you 
walking into me, he says, I didn't see you. <laughs> and so the idea that black people are human beings is relatively new. But I'm grateful to be on these grounds and these prestigious halls of learning at UOFs during this month when Steve Biko has been celebrated for having refused to give way. As we reflect on the life and work of an indomitable spirit, Morena Moshwesha Wapeli, allow me to draw from one who stood to defend the contributions of our leadership over the centuries, and one who insisted that the struggle for liberation is a continuation of the struggle that they started. Let me draw from a vision that Biko projected for us. And I know because I walked the streets of Fort Hare and the streets of Zuelicha and the streets of Deben with him, I know that in conversations that we had in those days, we talked about Ndate Mushweshwe, Morena Mushweshwe, we talked about Moroka, we talked about all the leaders that led this part of the continent before the colonial people arrived here. He says, as we start to reflect on Moshweshwe, Biko says, we have set out on a quest for true humanity. And somewhere in the distant horizon, we can see the glittering prize. Let us march forward with courage and determination, drawing strength from our common plight and our sisterhood and brotherhood. Because in time, we shall be in a position to bestow upon South Africa the greatest gift possible, a more human face." End of quote. Armed with this vision, we journey from Biko to Moshweshwe. Once we shall have accomplished that return to the sources, Like Biko did, we shall be able to cover space for our questions and the challenges that face us today. The road back to the sources and the return to our space and time is underpinned by democratic safeguards whose theoretical foundations were illuminated way back by none other than Karl Marx in the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte when he wrote, the social revolution of the 19th century cannot draw its poetry from the past, but only from the future. It cannot begin with itself before it has stripped off all its superstition in regard to the past. Earlier revolutions required recollections of the past in order to drag themselves concerning their own content, in order to arrive at its own content, the revolution of the future must let the dead bury their dead. There the phrase went beyond the content. Here the content goes beyond the phrase. End of quote. Kim Mushweshwe, the first. Bill Humphrey, in an article entitled Eight Facts About Kim Mushweshwe, the first, subtitled The Razor of Southern Africa, provides a list of what he calls additional claims to fame for Kim Moshweshwe. I'm also grateful for the 
documentary um, that was produced. I'm told that the author is here. I saw the interview that you did with SABC on that. I'm grateful for enabling me to get a perspective on King Mushweshu. Fact number one. Ndate Mushweshwe, Morena Mushweshwe, Wapili, founded his own new clan at age 34. Presumably on the strength of his charisma, his diplomatic flair, and cattle rustling skills. And I like the fact that this is written in English, because I think if it were written in Sesotho or Sesotho or any of our African languages, uh, it might create problems. This word, rustling, <laughs> uh, it's okay to stay there where it is <laughs> in English. This land established a settlement in a location that could withstand Zulu assaults. His original clan eventually grew to be Lesotho and the other areas. Now, my, <laughs> my, my friends, that I live with away from home here are made up of Botswana and Basotho. Now those who come from Bloemfontein, Basotho by Bloemfontein, Le Botswana by Bloemfontein, have a perennial problem between them. <laughs> um, but I'm glad I'm doing this lecture and I will tell you later why. I always say Bloemfontein and Tabancho is not part of Lesotho. <laughs> and my comrades and friends they say the whole of the free state, we are now working at Bloemfontein, <laughs> the whole of the free state. Kill <laughs> Lesotho. Now I think that is true in a much deeper sense than what people are saying when they say that. Because you see, when they articulate the point, they articulate the point in a manner that is not deep enough, in my view. And I hope this lecture will move me there successfully. They do it in a way in which the answer that you get or the reaction that you get is the one that people have been getting in the public hearings that have been taking place for parliament in the last, is it two months, three months, on the land, where sometimes people say, where's your title deed? Now, if you articulate the question in a manner in which people say, where's your title deed? It's not deep enough, and it doesn't speak to why it is true that le fase la mura na mushweshwe lele ho. I hope I can get there in my argument. Fact number two, and this for today's lecture is the main fact. He never lost a major battle. He never lost a major battle. That's a fact on his own, and we'll come back to it. Fact number three, he ruled for 48 years against colonial onslaught. Many native rulers in Africa 
were unable to maintain such strong level of sovereignty and control in their domains during the, their period of reign. Fact number four, he united the various groups of Basutu people into a Basutu nation. Through a combination of battle followed by compassionate diplomacy rather than subjugation through conquest. Fact number five. He was very willing to mess with the Boers as they tried to invade. He would give them fair conditions for maintaining peaceful coexistence and then beat them back when they rebelled. Eventually, of course, they took over much of the outlying territories of his realm. But he never lost control of his, of his home kingdom. Fact, num fact number six, he beat the British military and then threw them a bone so they could make peace with dignity. I wish I was still a teacher because I would spend hours with students trying to get into this. What does it actually mean? Fact number seven, he manipulated various Europeans to get defensive weapons and surprisingly to get valid foreign policy advice to fight off the settlers. He also used them to help preserve local culture in written form for future generations. And I'll come back to this um, briefly when I talk about France. And finally, fact number eight, he successfully negotiated an intervention by Queen Victoria to preserve Lesotho against all attempts at, settle, at settler seizure via protectorate status. I like this summary personally, but I like it only for its convenience. The great life and political preeminence of Morena Mushweshwe Wapili demands greater depth and width, particularly from scholars. Be that as it may, there is one that does better than all of the ones in the summaries. And the many that we should have had but do not have in order to do justice to the staunch character of African history. And I'm referring to fact number two. He never lost a major battle. This is the theme of my reflections. He built the nation, and in doing so, he never lost a major battle. He is that, how is that, sorry, particularly for those of you who are in government, how is that for a politician's KPA, key performance area? never to lose a major battle. He could withstand Zulu assaults. He could reign for 48 years. You guys are complaining about Mugabe's 
30 years. <laughs> Let alone for Zuma's 10 years. <laughs> He was willing to mess with the Boers who tried to invade, but there was something deeper in him. He could achieve coexistence. And so that was a small battle. <laughs> he could push the military of the British people another small battle. He could negotiate with the queen, another small battle. He never lost a major battle. He set an impossible bar for political leadership of the future. Yes, years later, those who were to lead and attempt to build African nations were to be measured in different degrees of failure and success relative to the standard that Morena Mushwashwapili said. There are names to recall just a few included include Dr. Nsumo Khele, leader of the Basutuland Congress Party of Basutuland Congress Party. Sam Nujoma of Namibia. Kamusa Banda of Malawi. Kenneth Kaunda of Zambia. Samora Machel of Mozambique, Julius Mualimu Nyerere of Tanzania, Robert Mangaliso Sobukwe of the pan African Congress of Azania, Oliver Reginald Tambo of the African National Congress, Holisha Nelson Mandela of the ANC, Stephen Bantubonge Biko of the Black Consciousness Movement of Azania, Robert Mugabe of, Zim of Zimbabwe, Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, Amilka Cabral of Guinea Bissau. The question is can any of them, and I mean any, of them, the ones that I have mentioned and the ones that I have not mentioned, measure up to the standard set in the late 19th century. Never lost a major battle. The list is long. Of him, we can comfortably confirm with the, with the historians that this was so. Now, earlier on, I jumped from a vision which Steve Bigo committed for the BCM, a vision that became and has become and remains the historical burden for the BCM, a vision of the greatest gift ever to be bestowed on the South African nation, the gift of a human face. We jumped from there back to the political bar set by Morena Mushweshe Wapili. I want you to allow me to jump forward again many, 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 many years. To check with new generations of Af African activists, revolutionaries, intellectuals, to just ask the question, can any one of them measure up to the bar? Mind you, 
they articulated new and deeper challenges for the African predicament. They asked new questions. Nigerian intellectual and sociologist wrote a book called Revolutionary Pressures in Africa and concluded at the end of the book with a question. The question is, which way Africa? What is the choice facing Africa? Is it socialism or is it barbarism? He summarizes his analysis by reminding his readers that the contradictions of underdevelopment will persist beyond the date of independence. According to him, the capitalist system that colonialism imposed on Africa will ensure a long drawn out economic stagnation in the countries of the continent. He insists the contradictions will not be resolved through bread and circuses. These are his own words. He says, circuses perhaps, but not bread, because this would simply not be available. One thing that would surely be needed in ever increasing quantities in the situation of the African predicament is repression. As the economic stagnation persisted, the masses would become more wretched and desperate and the contradictions will develop. Wretchedness and desperation will lead the persons to subversion. It will lead workers to industrial action. It will lead the lumpen proletariat to robbery and violence. And then punitive expeditions will be sent out to liquidate villages. Armed robbers would be punished by public executions and other crimes against property will be dealt with by imposing sanctions of exceptional harshness. Striking workers will be chased by police dogs, will be locked out, will be starved out, will be shot at. When I watch, I wish there was no television. I really wish there was no television because there are lots of things that I would rather not see. Comrade Mudise, the first defense minister in the new government in South Africa, when we were establishing the Freedom Park in Pretoria, he was the first chairperson of the board that was establishing the Freedom Park, said to me, let me have a quick and perhaps a final conversation with you, Professor Musala. You are younger than the people in the board here. You are an activist. You know where we come from with the struggle. Um, I'm an older generation. I'm a passing generation. But can I leave a plea with you, a message, a plea, a request, so that when your time to pass comes, you can also ask other young people to pass that plea. And he said to me, whatever happens, please look after peace. Protect peace. 
He says, the greatest achievement of the struggle is peace. You young fellows may not have been there with us in the other countries where we come from. You may not have seen, you don't want to see, he put it this way, you don't want to see your mother or your aunt uh, or your sister running away from their country with a mattress on their head, looking for a new home. Says we're giving you a country, protect peace. And so I remembered that when I reflected on fact number two. He never lost a major battle. He may have given away the free state. He may appear to have given away Aliwal North where a treaty was signed that allowed him to retreat back onto the other side of the Caledon. He never lost a major battle. Where there was a major battle, he did not retreat. <laughs> Where there was no major battle, it didn't matter if he retreated. It was actually his choice. He never was pushed back by anybody. Nobody chased Mushweshwe back onto the other side of the corridor. Never, no, no one ever pushed him back. All other nations have histories of being pushed back. Not only African nations, elsewhere in the world, all wars that people have fought, that I have read about, people have experiences of having been pushed back. Even the Chinese, Mao Zedong even writes about the fact that there is a time when you must retreat, and there is a time when you must advance. And the great revolutionary knows which time to advance, which time to retreat. Not so with Moshwesh. There's no timetable <laughs> set externally for retreating. The bar is you don't lose a major battle. You save the energy by allowing insignificant battle to pass. But you do not lose the major battle. I'm sure you are reading my mind. There is just so much we could have put aside in the last 24 years. I can think of one thing at least that I did personally put to Comrade Nelson Holisatla Mandela. I asked him before the negotiations were finished, when we were negotiating about whether I go with him or not, I said to him then, what are we going to compromise on? And what is the main thing that we will not compromise on. You can't go into a negotiation with everything on the table. I personally think that the issue of poverty, the eradication of poverty, eradication, is a elimination, eradication. I didn't say the, the alleviation of poverty. I said the eradication of poverty is almost a divine imperative. It can't, there can't be a God that approves of poverty. At least not the one I worship. <laughs> so 
So, Ake says, we have a vicious circle promising ever more blood and sweat. And so it would appear that the choice for Africa is not between capitalism and socialism, but between socialism and barbarism. Which will it be, he asks, end quote. But surely, the intellectuals like Claude Ake, the new activists, the revolutionaries, must have come across the insights of, of Murana Mushwesho the first. They must have heard what the historians are saying about him. I have no reason to believe that the historians would lie about an insight. They usually lie about facts, but not an insight. And so years later, those who were, sorry, see, I'm, a, I'm, I'm also a preacher, so this page is usually on this side and this one on this side. <laughs> so I'm reading a page I've read already. They must have come up across the writings concerning his reputation and his successes. So where did things go wrong? Why does Ake, why does the, what Ake is saying sound like it may have some truth in it? When and where and how did we read Murana Moshwashwe wrongly? How did the political text of his leadership escape us? What did we not hear? Particularly when the historians say about him, he never lost a major battle. Let's go back to the summary of a summary of a summary. There's only four bullet points. They say he ruled for 48 years. He was willing to mess around with the Boers. He beat the British military army. He successfully negotiated an intervention by Queen Victoria. In other words, he defended the land. He never lost a major battle. And the historically shattering outcome of not losing a major battle is that he built the nation. And great leaders build the nation. They build nations. As they say in statistics and in data science, there is a complete multicollinearity between building the nation and defending the land. Leaders that defend the land also build the nation. And leaders that build the nation defend the land. Morena Moshwesha Wapili defended the land and built the nation. He built the nation and defended the land. He never lost a major battle. Many years later, not in Africa, not about Africa, Daniel Singer takes us to the land of the famous revolution and memorable slogan that is France. And many of you will remember the famous slogan, liberty, equality, Fraternity. That was in 1789. Kim Mushwe was three years old at that time, having been born in 1786. 
if the historians are not lying. <laughs> when we hear what Daniel Singer says about this, about this land of revolutions, the revolutions of 1789, 1848, 1851, we understand why even this country, France, and its usual cultural influence could not distract Kim Mushweshwe. You know that the French um, prefer cultural imperialism. Um, they are just slightly better than the Portuguese. Um, they don't do things that are not subtle. <laughs> they make you read their books. They teach you how to read. They translate your Bible. <laughs> they write your poems. They decide on your, on your orthography. Um, never lost a major battle. Singer says about his country years later. Not so long ago, it was fashionable in le left-wing circles to talk of the need to get into the engine room of the capitalist economy and to lay a hand on the commanding levers. The metaphor was both deceptive and instructive. It was not much use and could even be dangerous to maneuver the levers of command differently unless one was ready to overhaul the engines drastically. Mitterrand, President Mitterrand, the first president to do a state visit in South Africa after President Mandela was elected president of South Africa. Mitterrand and his comrades demonstrated that one could do better still, enter the engine room in the moment of crisis, enter it as a rescue team, and the takeover having been completed, continue roughly the same way. They showed the socialists of the Western world how to win an electoral battle and to lose a political war. Not so, Morena Moshweshwe, the first. He refused to enter the engine room of the colonialists. He was not going to compromise by accepting the promise of an electoral victory while losing the political war. He never lost a major battle. He defended the land. Now, scholars like me have a burden. We never finish writing. <laughs> This paper is incomplete, <laughs> but it has a conclusion. I still want to say more and more and more and more. <laughs> but I want to conclude, I will say more on paper. I want to conclude particularly because of the debate on land. I think Murana Moshoshwa can teach us a thing or two, but I want to conclude by reading just two things, short things, from a book I picked up recently called Rethinking the Economics of Land and Housing. And then I will sit down. Under the subtitle, Land Ownership, origins of the theory and forms. This author says, the notion that land could be turned into property was one of the key developments of the Enlightenment in the 17th and 18th century. Thinkers such as Thomas Aquinas, Hugo Grotius, Samuel Puffendorf argued that property emerged 
of the, out of the interplay between the individual and the state. I'll leave that like that and read a final piece and then sit down. And this piece sorry, is entitled You'll find it in the complete paper. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote, uh, oh, I can see I'm reading the wrong, the wrong page for the wrong book, page 52. Here we are. Here we are. It says, the subtitle is, and this is very important, those of you who are debating the land, I'd like you to remember Morena Moshweshwe and the notion of losing or not losing the major battle. This piece here says, land is permanent. Capital is temporary. Land cannot be produced or reproduced. It cannot be used up as in finished. You can't finish it it does not depreciate. He never lost a major battle. Thank you. Like a cycle no wheel, what goes around, like a yo-yo no spring, what goes up, like four seasons, winter will always follow after fall and spring will always come before summer and that was intended. Just like you being here is intended, just like a prayer to bless your heart, a brilliant song to grab your breath and release you from all tension, a smile to show you how much I appreciate you, a cheer to make you laugh and relax your mind from all chaos, even if it's just for a second. And that makes me no angel, just me. Me that wanna lay a hand yet has nothing to offer. Me that wanna travel places yet trapped by fear and paranoia. You that wanna be on that valley yet afraid to fall like that big stone rolling from that mountain high straight to the river. Oops, and never be seen again. Me that want to be healed from all my illnesses yet seeing no reason to live. You that want to be with those that you love yet them busy dying on you and all you left with is some memories following me wherever you go like some freaking shadow. As much as it's all hard though, me feeling like I'm floating, sinking in a pool of sorrows. Hopefully things will follow into their rightful places. Soon as you cling tight to your faith and revisit your spirit zone and unleash your bravery, realize how much I'm worth, realize how my spirituality is much, much more powerful than my physicality, hoping that that on its own will be an assistance for you to cross that bridge, that on its own will be an assistance for you to run that longest race and finish the race, be on that mountain top and reach the vision peak, swim that deep has sea and fear no shark, spread my wings and fly high, even the sky shouldn't be the limit to what I can achieve, see I want to be inspired, like newly words, heart beating as one, complimenting each other like your body and soul, only when the other one dies, the other one lives on, and the great part is you don't even need to be on any cash, all you gotta do is revisit your spirit zone and be free. I got a girl born a Muslim ho, Muslimonene, Mechabo, Yaba, Sort Ho, we, Bebe Sitze, Tetana, Tekali, Ruti, Masuela Sikari Tower, Ivy Pepinining, Maya Shre Shre, Gasse Shre Shre, Muslim Fatting, Lamushre Shre, Ma, Paracubo, Siana Marena, Yonako, Yabo Hardy, Fielo, Alet Hati, Moseme, Aulo, He, Aretswana, Mudianio, Aima Metipilami, Haladi, Palisa, Zanahe. 
asibo tle sebo ko mangwana hai a feleditswe ke ngkhono wa tsona di tlogolo le di tlogolwana a bo ka ba seng ba fitile le hole bo hatlatla matsholo mohlodi wa mahodimo le mafatso ba le fihlile ka jeno tsa silo mosotho mosotho a i gopolang e bile a gaba ka boigantso ba seo a leng sona asibo tle sebo Tlompo e bi di jotsa moya le rato le bili pilong tsa botlhe botho e bi mantle tsetletse hela ngwana mo buka jeno o yentse taba mehlaphe ya ntate e ka sakeng o bile modisa wa nete ho ba setso bonono bo chaba bo eta pele re tla ithuta ho tswa ho wena mabasotho Uh, Mr. Vice Chancellor, members of Rectorate, uh, ladies and gentlemen, may I take this opportunity uh, to ask the staff of community engagement to come forward to hand over the presence to our guest speaker, to our Vice Chancellor, and to the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Puleng Linkabula. And as they come in forward, we are also privileged that in our midst, we have representatives of Mohatro Watesele, which is an organization that is actually organizing uh, people within the diaspora to follow in the footsteps of Morena Moshwechwe. Kita kupa melinda de ba Mohatro Watesele, ba teka pili, ba tuwa pesa morektoro, I kindly request that uh, uh, we will firstly start with the guest speaker, Professor uh, Mosala. It has been an honor and a privilege to uh, listen to you and thank you very much for your inspiring words. And then we, that is uh, what uh, the community of the University of Free State in, wants to show their appreciation for you.
Tintile mulumu sana hadi. Wai kia kwa kwa wana badi reki. Ora kwa mangura kwa mapere. Hawa na besunza wa kwa wana lelea. Tirte pa gil taikil kete. Kinda kutu inda kwa kwa. Kinda kutu inda kwa kwa. Mwana mshoshe nesu mutana lili fufu. You try to talk so soon to me again. When you are here, you must try to talk so soon to me. Mwona wapiri ya mholo. Wapiri urula kuwa wa sabaka sina. Kiena mambugi. Habu yao kutundi tona taka taka tuni tukasa mabu ya tuweba. Ligundi la tula mambugi sikaba. Oba kutamu sadi ya nuluka ningu. Aka nyafawe te jualo. Ito nza hanali kaya ni hati ya ina. Shibili ni mcheng. Yukasa mshana isu. Uru kwa sasa basu. Emu sasa ajili wa atu. Sapaudu le mogo kakizi. Ndati. Kia osumpa.
Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. In the interest of time, uh, we all had what the speaker had to say, uh, and we are going to give over to you. To, if we have any questions uh, for clarity or a comment, uh, we are going to allow four people. Uh, is, do we have Rovi Mikes around? Can you raise your hand so that we can... So contributions will be welcome. Normally, after a speaker has said something, people want to debate. But it could be interesting if you make a contribution, because it will benefit all of us. First question, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think it was more painful when you started. I nearly cried when you said black people are human too. Uh, when you ended, I think you also ended well to say my chief was not actually uh, a coward. He, he knew his battles and he could uh, pick where the problem is. We, as black people, we're living in a space that is still having issues. And you are teaching us to manage the space and also to teach others that we are human too. So I think it's good that our rector is here to also have picked the message that black people are human too in the space that we live in. There's still lots of issues, but I liked when you ended to say uh, he was not a coward. The values that we picked from him to always respect people should not undermine people when they are being respectful to them. So I think a lot of people should learn, and I think our white colleagues, I wish they could have been here, they could have picked this message quite nicely, so that they realize that when they are being respected, it's not because we are hopeless or we, we still have values of Mushu Eshwe, and we respect because we took those values from him. I thank you, Ndati. I nearly cried when you started, but I kept uh, cool when you said he was not a coward. He only knew how to manage his, the issues and respect. So Thank respect you. helped us to say, um, I should not be immature. I should not be reckless in raising issues, but I must still have respect. So that respect is key. So that's what we, we actually uh, got from him. I really thank you, Ndati. Thank, thank you very much, sir. We are here to celebrate and not to cry. Uh, can we recognize this side? Tanginda <laughs> Desibudi. My name is, is Upa Sibudi. We have got a committee in township uh, trying to write the history of Mangao. Now there's a part that we are not sure of. More Tabi, more Mabel Hill towards Andrus Pretorias. There was a settlement there. There were people staying there. So we don't get the gist of who were there and what have you. So we want to ask the people here to please help us with the history. That's why I want to learn Taburi. So if you have anybody who has some story about anything, to write it on express. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, after the, the, the meeting, just meet with me. I will link you up with the right people in the university. Uh, Where are we? Yes, Ndare. Oh, that side. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, also, we'd like to give a revolutionary salutations to you, Ndare, Professor Itmele Mosala, because Azapo and comrades like you refuse to participate in negotiations, and for that we are giving you a revolutionary uh, salutations. Because now history is punishing those who went to negotiations and betraying the struggle of our own people. But also you talked about what we said I think can relate with uh, national politics, but now I'm here to represent the student. So I just wanted to understand what can the current student, <coughs> in particular here at the University of Free State, learn or take from the leadership qualities from Moshe Equally, I think that picture is beautiful and can replace that statue of staying there. So you 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 talked about 
you, 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 you highlighted all the leaders from Africa and you said uh, you tried to, do, to put comparative studies to say Moshe Oshin never lost a major battles. I think as a student you must make sure that we don't lose a battle to remove stain. That is the biggest battle and if we lose that battle then we are betraying the struggle of Moshe Oshin. So I'm here to promise you. So I'm here to promise you that for us, the student, to make sure that we don't lose the biggest battle as a tribute to Moshe Eshwe. When you come back, okay. back Africa. here at home, you will see the statue of Moshe Eshwe, not the statue of, 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 of Stain. That one we're even prepared to die for. As you said, the Biko was prepared to die for certain things. We are prepared to die to make sure that we remove that stage. Thank and you very much, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think we must use the language that is accommodative and let us not die, let us live. We want to see young people living. I want to recognize uh, the High Commissioner of uh, Lesotho in South Africa. He's going to make a comment. Welcome, sir. Master of Ceremonies, I want to register my appreciation for having invited me to come to this occasion and listen to such very productive speech that we have had from Professor Itumele Msala. <clears throat> I am speaking as the High Commissioner of Lesotho my role as a High Commissioner is to establish relations between the two countries, Lesotho and South Africa. One which is nestled in the belly of a huge economic country called South Africa. South Africa is our only, labor, only neighbor. But we pride ourselves in the ability to maintain the sovereignty of great leader Mushreshwe. We take also cognizance of the fact that when you look at Lesotho, the northern part of Lesotho, there are the Zulus of Mama Siboko. The southern part of Lesotho, there are the Khozas. Now, central is Basotho. And these people I'm referring to have blood relations with the people of South Africa. But we are two nations. Ours is to establish relations. How can we ad be advised the two countries to realize the importance of establishing such close relationship that will make the two countries live side by side as brothers, realizing that in the 80s, you talk of Steve Biko and the youth of South Africa who went to live in, South in Lesotho. And Lesotho, small as it is, becoming the epicenter of the Southern African liberation struggle. How can we establish a relation that will make us respect the legacy of Moshesh and see that Lesotho, uh, South Africa, Zimbabwe, South Africa, and the other countries may have those relations, but they have 
the other countries have advantage that they can still be able to move elsewhere, but we are bottled inside uh, this major country. How, how can we be assisted to come up with a relations that will make us happy uh, when we cross the borders, when we come to this place, we don't feel that now. It may be difficult for our students to get study permits. We find that because of the special nature of relations, there are some arrangements that are made. When we go to hospitals, people realize the legacy of Mushweshwe and these being what can connect us together as the two countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we're going to take the last one. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, th thank you very much. I think my, my question is, that, in fact, it's, I'll start by making a short comment. Uh, if, if you are to ask a question, Prof, you'll be amazed that most of the figures that you have mentioned in your presentation, most people do not know. It is so sad how much we do not know our history. It is so sad to an extent that I can tell you anything about the Russian Revolution. I can tell you anything about the French Revolution. But I cannot tell you anything about the figures that you have mentioned in your presentation. I do not know how best we can ensure that all of these figures are inculcated in our, in our history. I recently saw that the basic education have decided that history will become a compulsory language. But the question is, what type of history is going to be taught? I think that, that, is, that, is, a, that, is, a big, that is a big concern. For example, you look at uh, Mushraj have been one of the central figures, especially in the history in this area of the free state. But if you are to look around, even in this university, you will never see anything that is King Mushraj. So, 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 so my question basically is, how do we ensure that this history is inculcated? Because if this history is inculcated in the curriculum, we will not have uh, you know, because, because when we, if, if we are to look at the, both the social and historic context, you are more likely to repeat, uh, you're more likely to repeat errors of the past if your history is not complete. And you are more likely, you are more likely to create a society that becomes sensitive if there are similar injustices aligned, if they know very well their historical uh, context. So, so I think that I'm not sure that it was very clear the question, but I think, uh, I think that's, that's what I want to, yeah, it's around the question of decolonization of the curriculum in higher education and also basic education. Thank you very much. I think at this point, I don't know if Professor Musala wants to make some few comments uh, and then uh, after that, we, the session will be over. Uh, Professor, do you want to respond to some of the questions and comments made? Can I kindly uh, request Prof. Yeah, while I, sitting. I, I thought most of them were really comments. Yeah. I, the, the comment I can make is that I, I agree with a lot of sentiments um, that were expressed here. There's hardly anything that I violently disagree with. What, what there might be is... Um, uh, 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 you know, give or take, we're in the same train. <laughs> um, the issue of Lesotho and South Africa is one that requires courage from African people around the, throughout the continent. This issue of colonial borders. Um, I as I said earlier on, I taught at the University of Botswana. And it was, a, it was a pleasant experience, but it came, it came to mind to me that here's a country that culturally and in every other way, and historically, in fact, the headquarters of Botswana used to be in South Africa. 
quite apart from anything else. Mafikeng used to be the headquarters for Botswana. You know, Lady Brand, Lesotho. So we were one. We 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 were one before colonialism made us many. <laughs> and I I and. And apart from the cultural thing, from the economic point of view, these borders are not viable. <laughs> They're just not viable. Because to all intents and purposes, Basutu, economically, are in South Africa. <laughs> Botswana economically, are in South Africa. If we want to keep the borders, in this book that I was referring to, that where I talked about land, where they go back historically to show that um, land, that, that Western economic theory actually exiled land out of economics. <laughs> um, because if you don't, if, if land comes back into economics, um, all the people who work in South Africa from Lesotho don't, don't have to come here. Because just the, the tax that you can impose on South Africa <laughs> for the land that actually belongs to the Soto <laughs> is enough to make it redundant for people to come and work here. Um, all the companies that are here in the areas that uh, all, <laughs> you can even charge, um, uh, uh, you can go back historically and collect tax for all the years since South Africa <laughs> took over that land and, and, still, uh, and still rent it out to South Africa. <laughs> we can rent out <laughs> the land to From a true, proper economic point of view, um, Lesotho can sit back and just collect um, rental tax. Mm. Um, there was a time when there were more cattle than people in Botswana. At least when I was there, uh, there were more than a million cattle in, 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 in Botswana, and there were only 750,000 people in Botswana. And Botswana used to export meat um, to South Africa uh, and diamonds. Similarly, <laughs> Um, there's just over a million people now with, with all of the things that Botswana does for South Africa, they don't have to be here. They can collect economic rent for, of all sorts <laughs> from, from all of us. But, but that apart, we are one people. Mm. We've always been more one people. There are more Basutu in South Africa than in Lesotho. Mm. There are more Swazis in South Africa than in Swaziland. There are more Botswana in South Africa than in, in, in. We've never not been one people, except that we've um, we've not obeyed uh, the insight of Morena Mushwef. We've lost the major battle, and the issue of our oneness is an important component of our togetherness and oneness as a people. Uh, so that I would I would go there. I would get there. I would dissolve South Africa and, and Lesotho legally and dissolve Botswana. Yeah. I don't know about Zimbabwe, uh, uh, but Bulawayo, Bulawayo is South Africa in terms of people. Bulawayo is South Africa. Um, the rest of Zimbabwe is Mozambique. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that this is a critical issue, but I don't think there's any one of our politicians who have the political courage to even put that matter on the table. I didn't get to the, the part of my speech that I didn't manage to write was also going to talk about the economic predicament of the continent. Um, and how in spite of all the education we get, we just don't get certain basic things. For example, that foreign aid is not good for us. Mm. First of all, our thieves, our own thieves, steal it. 
um, our own warlords um, steal it and, they, and it finances internal battles on the continent. But worse than that, um, we use our foreign aid to buy overseas goods. We don't develop our economies. So more has come out of here than has come into here over the years. But we've got African economies, white and black. I'm not going to excuse white, white Africans. <laughs> white and black economies of enormous training and qualification. Why these issues are not raised? We're chasing irrelevant battles. We're busy with irrelevant things. I think just as a general comment for, 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 for all, and the issue of the curriculum is everything. Absolutely everything. We're now talking about um, free higher education, for example. Now, I was the head of higher education when New South Africa started. The proposal we put on the table was that we must not think about um, how we will fund students. You don't you don't, you don't fund students, you fund universities. Now, because you are not funding universities, universities are funding, uh, are, are taxing students. The equation is wrong. If, if the universities were funded and funded properly, there is no justification for student fees. Absolutely not. You know? <clears throat> And we did propose a fund to get, to roll the things back, to, to try and change slowly. And when I was the boss of higher education, there was money, there was plenty of money. Japan was awash with money. They had zero interest rates those years. Um, um, they were looking for places to dump money. They came to us in government and said, we can give you four billion US dollars for the NESFAS. You must blame me for NESFAS. When I started NESFAS, I wasn't, started, start, I wasn't starting what you guys are dealing with. I was starting a funded, um, a commercially managed fund that would have, that had a 22 year horizon. And by last year, that fund would have been able to fund student fees, they would have been, before the, the, the fees must fall things, it would not have been necessary to have fees must fall because the fund would have matured uh, after 22 years, last year. But we had money to set up that fund at 1% interest rate at a time when capital markets were charging something in the region of between 10 and 16%. And we would have grown that fund. <laughs> but we did not have the political courage, the guts, to grasp things. So, so curriculum, forget about curriculum, <laughs> because we were slow. What did we do? We ran to Australia and imported But anyway, I'm going on too long.
Director and Vice Chancellor, Professor Henry Crew Crump, Acting Vice Rector Academic, Executive Members, Managers of the University of the Free State, Dr. Mandu, Principal of Godwa Campus, Mr. Puram Golombani, Dean of Student Affairs, the Directorate of Community Engagement, which has been central to the organizing of this public lecture, members of the Student Representative Council and students of the University of the Free State, Mr. Mokosi, the High Commissioner of Lesotho, members of the Free State House of Traditional Leaders, the Morena Mupedi and members of Baguena Royal House, the parties of our province present, that is the economic development of yourselves as individuals of South Africa, the African continent, and the global community at large. I'd like to just share this as a thank you to all of you that I've uh, outlined in the table of precedence, but more so to thank Professor Itumeleng Masala. Can we please give him a round of applause? Thank you. But more so for Professor Hitumeleng Musala, known to many of us as Tower, for reminding us that the legacy of Murena Musheshu is an invitation for all of us to learn to affirm the dignity or the humanity of all of us, to draw on the imperative to prioritize what it is that wounds us from being human and what invites us from igniting the best in us as we are purposed to be. For reminding us that in the different geopolitical, economic, religious and social contexts, leadership must make the decisions that facilitate the fullness of life for humanity but also for the context within which the humanity lives. And finally, I heard Professor Musala saying, it is up to us to understand who we are, what makes us who we are, and why it's important for us to always, always ensure that no one denigrates our humanity. And I think these are entwined with the very legacy of Mushoshwe that he aimed at enabling us to understand. For you, youth and young adults, your task now is to draw from this leadership, ethical, generous, ra with radical hospitality and understanding of the imperative for coexistence. legacy on what it is that will make us even better people, especially in the 21st century with all its challenges and opportunities. So, Prof, we thank you for that lecture.
But we also thank our Vice Chancellor for really inviting us to ensure that the public lectures of the university are enabling of society, academics, students, and all stakeholders to learn around why the university is a well and a foundation for knowledge, wisdom, and for development of the province and South Africa. It's only when management understands these imperatives of why Africanization, decoloniality, and also the imperative to ensure that education is accessible, not only accessible, but allows students to be successful as well, that we become relevant institutions within our societies. So I'm thankful to that, Prof, because if universities remain ivory towers of elites that do not even understand the contextual exigencies and the, the, and the quest for meaning by them to understand their reality and to imagine futures, then we'll forever be on the margins and not able to help our own people, our own society, and our own globe to have social justice as it continues to develop. And finally, I'd like to thank all of you for having attended this lecture, the Moshoshe Lecture. We are hoping to see you even in larger numbers next year. And you, the students, I'm hoping next year we'll have a competition where you'll write around Mushashwe and tell us how you think Mushashwe's legacy will contribute to you. Finally, Bishop and your team, this is a fantastic work. Please go back, look at the art, look at the names of uh, even women leaders around the time of Murena Mushashwe who were influential, know a little bit about Prophetess Manzupa, Mantatisi, and others, because Mushesha did not succeed on his own. He lived within a society. So thank you very much. This public lecture is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs> uh, just before we leave, I'm inviting all of us just to stand uh, for the singing of the national anthem and I'm going to ask uh, Mel Lucy to lead us in the singing. Uh, can there be silence as we sing the national anthem?